Okay, so I have 15 minutes in the sun at Transforming EDU to talk to you about big data, cognitive science, and machine learning. So I'm sure we'll have a lot of extra time left over, but you know, we'll, <laughs> we'll go kind of fast. Um, so big data and what the impact of that will be on education. Let's say we start off the new year with a crystal ball. What would you want to ask your crystal ball? Well, I'm sure a lot of us are interested in what's the future of politics right now. Or maybe we're interested in economics. Or since we're in Vegas, maybe we're interested in sports. What if you're an educator? What would you ask your crystal ball if you were an educator? Well, you might be interested in what's going on in her head. What is she thinking about? What does she know? What does she not know? And if you're responsible for a group of students, you might want to extend that to the entire class. What are they thinking about? What do they know? What do they not know? And if you're responsible for several sections, you get the idea, or an entire school, you really need to know what's in their heads, what's going on. In order to do that, here's the good news. You don't need magic, such as a crystal ball. You don't need a robot tutor in the sky. What you do need, though, is some predictive analytics. And what I'd like to do is give you a very high-level view of predictive analytics. So basically what we're talking about is, is data, right? And we're talking about data and the right approach. And what that can give you is better learning. And if you design systems, if you're one of those boring platform makers, um, what you can do is you can do design experiences that help people build and retain knowledge. And that's kind of what my company is about, Sergo. I founded this company several years ago with the goal of really helping to transform education, to help people learn and remember anything that's relevant, near, and dear to them, and to help them demonstrate that knowledge and capability. Um, essentially, what we want to do is we want to make people smarter. And I think you'd all agree that would be a good thing to be able to do. And we've done it this far with a really interesting ecosystem of partners. So we work with great folk from Arizona State University, edX, who we heard from earlier today. We work with New York University. We work with some publishers. We work with foundations. We work with uh, flight schools and all sorts of really interesting people who are using our technology to help get a better understanding for what's going on inside the heads of learners and help them improve. We're also doing it in about 10 nations around the world, obviously in the US, Japan, Rwanda, et cetera. So let's talk about modern education. Modern education, see if you agree with me, is kind of a one-size-fits-all model. That's what we're really up against right now. And we've been doing this since forever. The real model of classroom instruction has not changed in a very, very long time. We have this sort of vicious cycle of lecture and homework, and then we test students. And then the blaming starts, right? We get grades, and some people do well, and a lot of people don't do well. What's most significant also is you have a gap in knowledge, right? You have students who are missing some core foundational knowledge, and even though they're missing that, and we recognize that, we advance them. We push them forward into more classes, widening that gap. So that's kind of what a lot of education looks like today. And even if when we test students, if our friend here gives a test, to students, these two students here, and they both get a 90%, they look identical. They both get A's. The reality could be quite different, right? Because the student here, this young man here, he could have been spending days and weeks before that test in the library studying and working. And if we knew that, we would know something very different about him, right? Because his friend over here was partying the whole semester, right? That's her right there in a bar. And she's been drinking the whole semester, and then she's doing something called cramming. How many of you have ever, ever heard of cramming? Okay, it's some bizarre technique that was used a long time ago to, where you could party all semester, cram for a moment, and take a test. If we knew this about these students, what we would know is that our guy on the left, he's going to remember this stuff for a very long time. He's going to have good long-term retention. And our girl there, she's going to be like steam coming out of a tea kettle. It's going to be over with 24 hours later. She will have forgotten everything. So that's the gold standard for measurement right now. We give people tests. It's a one snapshot in time. And that's not a really great way to judge people for education. The system right now is about constraining the time to learn. We limit the time students have to learn. And we get variable outcomes because of that. What if you kind of reverse this? What if you were able to vary the time to learn and have one fixed outcome, which was success? And what if at the same time you were able to help students develop a positive mindset of grit, perseverance, and agency? That'd be pretty good, right? So how do we get there? 
how do we basically build that? How do you design and implement that at scale, right? How do we go from having no idea what's in their heads to having a very clear sense and knowing exactly what students know? That's kind of the goal. And I think one of the ways you get there is via predictive analytics. So let's dig a little bit deeper into this. Big data, big data is wonderful, right? The promise of big data, we're gonna have a big impact, it's gonna be massive and revolutionize the world. Um, some of us believe we're in a little bit of a data overload mode where we have way too much data and we have exhaust. We have this data exhaust. We're throwing tons of information at people who don't necessarily have the skills or the time to really evaluate and understand that data. Right? Then there's the small data versus big data argument. Some people say, well, you don't need big data, you have to go small data, and that's the latest buzzword, bingo. I think that the good news is that size really doesn't matter. What's important is that you have the right data. And with the right data, you have quality over quantity. I think that's what's really essential here. And what you can then do is you can extract meaning and use it to really improve outcomes and to improve something important. That would be an ideal scenario. So the way this kind of works, if you look at sort of the, uh, a traditional approach to big data and machine learning, you start with big data, you do some machine learning voodoo on that big data, and you end up with predictions. And this is essentially a black box. You really don't know what's going on in that model. There are a lot of companies out there that talk about the intersection of machine learning and big data and neuroscience. Who knows what really is going on? But if you look through the lens of cognitive science, you can do something very, very interesting. You can, one, you can start to define the right data. What is the data that you need to instrument to really figure out what's going on with learners? You can then define the right models, right? We focus on a model that's built on memory decay, right? But you need to define your right, correct model to evaluate that system. And then finally, you can interpret predictions. And with that, you can have a great feedback loop where your predictions are actually making your machine learner learning smarter. This is a more modern approach, and this is basically what cognitive science allows us to do. And this is the focus of my company, Serago. I'll tell you a little bit about what we do. We basically use machine learning, of course, but our real expertise is around the science of learning, cognitive science. And it all started with this gentleman, Herman Ebbinghaus, my great-grandfather, who basically gave birth to the entire field of learning and memory. And Ebbinghaus did a very interesting thing. He basically predicted and was able to quantify forgetting, right? So he has the forgetting curve, or if you're an optimist, the learning curve, which says when information flies out of our head, it does so along a predictable function. It just doesn't disappear. And that's really given rise to the entire field of learning and memory, which is quite interesting. But that's 130 years ago, right, when Ebbinghaus did this. And he kind of quick kicked off the quantification of memory. But more recently, 22 years ago, people like Bjork told us that there's an optimal moment to review. It's called desirable difficulty. There's a precise moment when you want to have somebody represent information. And you can calculate that moment on an individualized basis. And it's only in the last five years that we have longitudinal data on how learning works in the real world. We finally have platforms that are capable of getting tons of data because up until then, it was all based on a couple of people in a lab participating in an experiment. So we leverage big data and cognitive science to improve how people learn. And I want to tell you a little bit about like, exactly how that works. I believe, I'm sure a lot of you do as well, that the intersection of the internet and learning science is going to be massive for education, especially when you have everybody running around with a microcomputer in their pockets 24-7 hooked to the interweb. And the learning science side, let's look at some core applications in action. We use an algorithm that we've nicknamed DARPA. This is not the DARPA you know, but our DARPA stands for the Distributed Adaptive Retrieval Practice Algorithm. This algorithm is capable of leveraging two of the most significant findings from cognitive science. If you want to build long-term retention, you space it out over time and distribute it. The devil's in the details of how you figure that out on a very granular basis. The other one is called retrieval practice, which means when you present information to people, you do it in such a way that they're, they're thinking about it. They have to retrieve it from memory. And that act of retrieving it, a probe, a quiz, some sort of an interaction, actually stimulates and strengthens the memory. So we've developed this algorithm to do that. We also use the science to ease metacognitive burden. Metacognition is, is thinking about your own thinking, right? And, and it goes even further into meta-memory, thinking about your own memory. We're not capable of knowing what's actually in our minds. We make predictions about what we know and what we don't know. 
metamemory and metacognition. When students sit down to study, a lot of their cognitive workload is focused on the task at hand. How much time should I spend? Where am I strong? Where am I weak? What should I really be doing now? How am I going to get through that test in two weeks? What time is dinner? All that's going on in our heads, right? And it takes away from the learning. But if you use the right algorithm in science, you can have a student come in and the system knows exactly who they are. Hey, Carrie, welcome back. Here's your new content. Here's your review content. Off you go. And lastly, what that allows you to do is really be able to quantify knowledge. You can have a system that continuously improves and personalizes through that feedback. Doesn't know you on day one, but by day four or five, it really understands your learning, your strengths and weaknesses on a very granular basis. So I'll tell you some things we discovered from their predictive analytics in action. When we look at our data for learners, what we see is that something very interesting that may be counterintuitive. The longer students spend looking at a question or looking at a probe, they're less likely to get that correct. The more time you spend now, the less likely you are to get that correct. We see that play out in the data. But, and if you considered a test environment, that would be a failure, right? But what's interesting is that the longer they'd spend thinking about it, the more they actually learn. And so what happens is they're more likely to get that information correct in the future. That's what the data tells us, right? And that's about building lasting knowledge, which I believe should be the goal of education. This concept is called effortful re uh, retrieval and desirable difficulty. That's the concept, that's the cognitive science at work when we look at the data. Um, we have a full stack solution. We help you know, authoring. We distribute through your favorite LMS of record. We have learning applications and we have insight applications. And our mantra at Cerego is really this concept of durable, flexible, and usable knowledge. It's not just about getting information into head, people's heads. It's their ability to transfer it and use it in the real world. And we've seen this demonstrated in academic business and special skills training. The other thing that we've discovered about our data that's really interesting is that there's, only some, there's something twice as effective as Cerego, and that's Cerego on the mobile device. Okay? And it might seem obvious, but it's really the science in action, because the, science, the cognitive science tells us little and often is the magic recipe to building lasting knowledge. It's not about two hours in front of a computer trying to learn. It's short little bursts right at the right moment. And the best way to do that is with some mobile device that can just say, hey, it's time to look at some content. And you can get in and out in two or three minutes. And students that do that see a 2x boost in terms of their overall performance, which is kind of cool. comes from the data. Not to leave the teachers um, behind, we also have predictive analytic applications that are mobile for an instructor. So imagine walking into class, just pulling out your phone, and you know exactly who's on target, who's off target, where they are. That'd be kind of cool. You also can get um, some insights about things you may want to cover in class. So the system can identify the actual problems that an entire cohort of students are having trouble with. That's the power of predictive analytics. We work with a really interesting group, and we've applied this from everything from humans' origins and astronomy at ASU to biology at MIT, even jazz at UT Austin. And Dartmouth has an opera course powered by Cerego, which is kind of cool. And we're in good company. Um, the cool thing about having a platform with a lot of data is that we can participate in a lot of ongoing research. We can test our own system, but we can also give that system to other organizations to basically run eff efficacy studies of their own, which we do. We work with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to roll out courses for community colleges, which is kind of cool. And lastly, in my remaining 38 seconds with you, let's go back to our friend here, this girl. We know what she's thinking, right? Do we know what she's thinking? We don't know what she's thinking. We obviously don't know what she's thinking. But we know what she knows today, and we can predict what she knows tomorrow. And that quantification of knowledge, with that in hand, we can personalize learning for her, for her class, and so on, and so on, and so on. You kind of get the idea. So for me, that's kind of the promise when big data and machine learning hit education. Three seconds to go. Two, one, thank you.